I used to out and explore the countryside whenever I could. I would often do this alone or with someone else. I, however, haven't done if at all since an experience that I had with a friend of mine when we were out hiking years ago. The first thing that I have to let you know is that the two of us were hiking in an area that we didn't have any right to be in. This was usually the case when we decided to go for a hike. It was always more fun to explore areas like that than it was to go hiking in places that were known for nature hikes. It was cool to possibly be seeing something that most people don't normally get to see and exciting to think about what we might come across. This was a hiking trip I took with my buddy Todd when we were still in college. We had a week off for spring and we wanted to do some exploring. So we took a drive to a very rural area that we had found online. Driving up into the hills, we found a convenient area to put our car in that we figured would be safe for it, and then we hiked out in the woods. We had never been in this area before, so we had no set agenda of how we were going to explore. We simply started out blindly, hiking through the woods. We were pretty high up in the hills when we set out, and the area that we had parked the car in was actually very dark due to the large amount of foliage in the area. It could have seemed a bit creepy at first if we wanted to take it that way. There wasn't a whole lot that happened the first few days. That is not to mean that we didn't see a lot or enjoy ourselves, though. Just nothing that would really be scary to someone reading this story. It was on the third night that something really strange happened. We had set up our tents, and we were in them separately. I don't know if Todd had gone to bed yet or not, but I had the impression that he had. I, however, was up and I was reading a book. It was probably around 11 p.m. that night. I heard what sounded like a loud and shrill human scream. It cut through the regular sounds of the woods at night and startled me. I dropped my book, took my flashlight, and rushed to get outside of my tent. When I got out there, Todd was working his way out of his tent, too. I mentioned that I thought that he was sleeping, and that was because he seemed slightly out of it, too. No sooner than he had worked his way out of the tent, we heard yet another scream cut through the night. More prepared for it this time, we were able to tell which direction that it had come from. I was also able to tell that it was a male scream as well. It also seemed to be coming from a bit of a distance away from us. Todd asked me what I thought we should do, and I told him that I really had no idea. He suggested that maybe we should go and try to find whomever was screaming, and see if we could help him out. I agreed, but told him that we should bring our knives with us just in case. We took our knives and flashlights and started walking out into the direction that the screams seemed to have come from. I was hoping to hear another sound, regardless of how scary it might be, to try and get a better idea of where the screams had come from. It would have given us a much better indication of where we were going. Without any sounds from the guy we heard screaming, it was really like trying to find a needle in a haystack. We were hesitant to try calling out at first, because we had no idea exactly what had been hurting this man and causing him to scream. But as we kept fumbling through the woods and the trees, more time passed since we had last heard the scream. We realized if we were going to help him out, we would have to hear from him. That meant we had to call out to him, even if it meant risking calling attention onto ourselves. I called out a few times. It was terrifying to do so. If this man was being hurt by another human or by an animal, then we could be drawing that entity to us. And we were pretty scared with every noise we heard right after it. Unfortunately, we did not get any response from the man we had heard screaming. And no matter how hard we kept looking for him, we weren't able to find any trace of anyone in the dark. Worried that we might get lost after too long, we made the tough choice to go back to our tents and try to sleep. We would get up early in the next morning and go out and see if we could find anything or any clue as to what we had experienced. I don't think either of us slept the whole night. There was the constant wondering of what we had seen, coupled with the fear that something bad was out there. I had too much trouble thinking about the safety of whoever we heard screaming and whether whatever made it scream might show up at our campsite. The following morning, we went to go and check around once the sun had lit the entire area up. Todd seemed just as worn down as I had, but we really didn't talk about how we had slept. 
We just went and searched the area as best we can, now that we could see where we were going. I don't know what we were hoping to find. I kept fearing that we would come upon a dead body that had been murdered in some brutal way, and I kept focusing on the idea that it was probably a person who had injured the man that we had heard screaming and not an animal. It was Todd that eventually found something, and he called me over to have a look at it. There was an area that looked like there was obviously some sort of struggle, and on the surrounding ground and surrounding trees there was what looked like blood, a great deal of blood. We looked around a little bit more after seeing that, but not for very long. We were just too unnerved by the whole thing. Instead, we went back to our camp and discussed what we should do next. We decided that the best thing to do was to just hike back to the car and move on from there. I am not going to go into too much depth about that because nothing really happened. I mean, we had a general sense of unease the entire time. We were nervous and the slightest sound scared us. Plus. We couldn't get back to the car in one day, so we had to camp again. It was scary, but we didn't experience anything else after that. We gave a report to the police, but I have no idea if anything ever became of it. We gave them our contact information, and we never heard from them. If you are in the U.S., then you know that the weather has been absolutely terrible everywhere lately. Snow in L.A., tornadoes in the Midwest. So many storms, and they just keep coming. But the most recent bout of storms brought with it something I'd never thought to be concerned about. I was home alone because my husband works nights. I already don't like that, as I hate being home alone at night. I often double check the door locks, the windows, and jump at every noise. If someone else is home, I'm fine. But when I'm alone, I just get scared. Add to that severe thunderstorms and the threat of tornadoes when I live in a trailer. Well, you can imagine my anxiety. The rain was pounding on the roof and windows and was only drowned out by the cracks of thunder that seemed almost constant. I was reading a book to distract myself when the power went out. I swore and put down my book. I sat there waiting a moment, hoping the power would come back on. When the booming thunder made me jump. It rolled on for what seemed like ages as I sat in my chair in the dark, wondering what I was going to do now. But as the thunder ended, I noticed the night seemed oddly quiet. The rain, the wind, and now the thunder were all quiet. Was the storm passing? It seemed a bit quick for that, though I was happy to think maybe my power would be restored quicker if the storm were over. I stood up, thinking to get myself a drink and maybe prepare for bed, as I now had nothing to do. I used my phone as a flashlight and was walking toward the kitchen, marveling at the oddly quiet night, when I heard something distinctly not part of the storm. It began low and quiet and quickly ramped up into a piercing wail. I froze in place as I realized I was hearing the tornado siren. I didn't stay frozen long. I ran into my bedroom and hunkered down in my walk-in closet, but I didn't feel safe. All my life, I'd been hearing about what tornadoes do to trailer parks, and though I was deep in the closet, I just kept imagining a tornado picking up the trailer, and my being tucked away in the closet wasn't going to help anything as it threw me around. I suddenly realized that though I'd lost power, I hadn't lost everything. I had my phone. And decided to actually use it for the one thing I rarely use my phone for. I called my husband. I barely got out two sentences before he said, "Why don't you go to the shelter?" I had forgotten that our neighbors had a small tornado shelter. They had mentioned it a few times, and it wasn't at all far from my house. It's just that it had become part of the landscape and had completely slipped my mind. My neighbors were only in town on occasion, as their house here was their vacation house. I knew they weren't in town right now, and expressed this to my husband when he told me that they never locked it. It was a storm shelter, and they wanted to make sure they could get into it in an emergency. Get in the shelter; you'll be safe there, he said. I hung up and stood to leave the closet. It still sounded quiet outside, except for the siren. I quickly went to the door, slipped on my shoes, and went outside. It didn't seem to be raining, or if it was, it was very light. I heard no thunder and saw no lightning, but the feeling in the air could only be described as ominous. 
I turned the flashlight back on on my phone and carefully went down the porch steps. I walked quickly through the grass to my neighbor's yard. The shelter was a small structure partially buried in the ground. As I reached for the door, the wind picked up and I felt the strangest thing. The rain began again, quickly, but it wasn't normal rain. It wasn't falling like normal rain. It was horizontal rain. I had heard of this, but experiencing it was something else entirely. I jerked open the door and ran inside, slamming it behind me. It was only upon reaching the bottom of the stairs, soaked from the sudden downpour if you could call it that, that I realized there was a light on in the shelter and I wasn't alone. For half a second, I expected to see my neighbor standing there, or even another neighbor using the shelter as it had been left open. But the shelter was small, just a single room, no bigger than the average bedroom. Across the room, just feet away, lying on the built-in bench against the wall was a man I'd never seen before. He had blankets for a makeshift bed. There were items strewn about him on the floor, and I simply knew he had been living in the shelter. He glowered at me from the bench, sitting up with the blankets hanging off his head, making him look like some perverse homeless nun. I stood at the foot of the stairs, frozen with uncertainty. A loud rumble of thunder reminded me why I had come down here. I forced myself to calm down. I had met homeless people around here before. There was no reason to assume this man was dangerous. He just needed a place to stay, and here was an unlocked shelter just waiting to be used. I managed a shaky, hi, but he just stared. I didn't move from the foot of the stairs. I very much wanted to run back up them and into my house, but the roar from outside kept me from doing so. It was then that I realized I wasn't hearing thunder. It had to be the wind. It was loud and piercing. It sounded like a freight train. I'd heard it said before, but it was only now that I realized it wasn't someone being poetic. It sounded exactly like the roar and chugging of an oncoming train, muffled only by the fact that I was in the shelter, buried underground. I raised my voice above the din and told him my name. He still didn't answer. He glared, a look of utter hatred in his eyes. Look, I'm sorry to disturb you, but it's a tornado, and this is my friend's shelter, I explained. Suddenly he stood up, his makeshift habit of blankets falling behind him. It's my house, he shouted, raising an arm and pointing at nothing. I know you've been staying here, I began, but he continued shouting, slowly staggering toward me. It's my house, he shouted. Mine, get out. There is a tornado out there, I shouted back, not at all sure where I got the courage from. I was still standing at the foot of the stairs, and I could hear the wind, the sounds of distressed metal, the howling and screeching. Get out! Get out! He shouted over and over again as he staggered toward me from across the room. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't very well leave. There was a tornado out there. But this man was coming at me. My eyes shot around the room for any sort of weapon but there was nothing within reach. When he was in reach, I tried to push him away. He was much bigger than me, but his staggering gait made me think for a moment that I could take him. Then he grabbed me with strong hands and all my pushing had no effect. Let go of me, I shouted against his constant screeching of, get out, greet. He began trying to drag me up the stairs. He was actually going to throw me out into the tornado. I smacked him hard across the face and screamed, there is a fucking tornado at him, but this only made him angry as he returned the slap, hard. It hurt like hell, but I realized he was only holding me with one hand now, and I wrenched myself from his grasp and lunged toward the other side of the room. I tripped and fell, but I kept scrambling, trying to grab anything that I could use as a weapon. My hand fell on something solid and hard, it felt like wood. As he stood over me and reached down to try to pick me up and drag me out again, I swung the object at his head and completely missed. He wrenched it from my hand and threw it, then picked me up. He tried to throw me over his shoulder, but I was having none of it. I, I struggled and kicked, and he had to half carry and half drag me toward the door, all the time alternating being muttering my house and screaming, get out. I was doing my best to make things difficult for him. I didn't want to be out in this storm. I didn't want to die in a tornado and I didn't want to die to some crazy man hiding in my friend's shelter. I kicked and screamed, struggled and scratched, and by the time we were halfway up the stairs, 
he was more dragging me than carrying me. One arm was at my chest and the other at my throat. I started to feel like I was choking. He was wearing a filthy shirt and he reeked. For some reason, this is what I thought before I squirmed my way into a position to bite his arm. I sank my teeth in as hard and as far as I could, and he howled and dropped me. I slid down the stairs and he shouted and cursed, shaking his arm. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I quickly crawled toward the far end of the room. I was terrified of what he would do to get me back for that. I also wanted to be as far away from that door and the roaring tornado as I could get. But when I reached the other side of the room and turned around, he hadn't followed me down the stairs. Instead, he was staring at me, glowering like he had before, holding his wounded arm in his other hand. Suddenly he turned, and with the roar of the wind, he'd opened the door and stepped out into the storm. I was shocked. I just sat on the bench furthest from the stairs and stared up at the open door. I could see nothing but darkness and the rain that was now running down the steps. But I huddled on the bench in the corner, staying away from the homeless man's belongings. I didn't know if he was dead or if he'd be back, but I also just didn't want to touch them. The wind and the siren filled the night, and a small waterfall formed on the stairs from the rain, but after a few minutes it all died down. I sat there, lightly touching my face where he'd slapped me. Suddenly I realized he could come back and he could be armed and much angrier. I quickly searched for another weapon and found the wooden object I had tried to hit him with before. I was surprised. It was a wooden Lucky Cat statue. It was mine. It usually sat on my front porch but had disappeared a few weeks ago. I thought it had gotten blown away in a previous storm. It was rather heavy, but the winds had been knocking down trees, so a little wooden cat didn't seem too strange a thing to blow away. But it hadn't blown away. He had taken it. He had been here for weeks, living in this shelter, mere yards from my house. A chill ran through me as I realized this. Part of me felt bad for him, being homeless. But that didn't mean he wasn't dangerous. I realized I didn't lock the door when I left my house to go to the shelter. He could have gone there. I clutched the cat to me and stood up to grab my phone that I now realized I had dropped at some point in the struggle. I picked it off the floor and flipped it over. I was delighted to see it was getting a signal. Not much of one, but it was something. I called my husband. I stayed in the shelter until he came home. Thankfully, there were no strange people in our house which was still in one piece. The tornado had hit but it was a little south of us, and thankfully, though there was damage, no one was hurt. There was no sign of the man who had been staying in the shelter. I think my neighbors should be locking it from now on. I know I'll feel much less foolish when I triple-check my locks from now on. You never know who could be out there. Just a few steps from your front yard. I will never forget this really strange house that I lived in when I was a teenager. It wasn't for a very long time, and I was pretty thankful for that. That is because some really weird things went on inside that house. This isn't as much of a narrative as it as an explanation. I am sorry if that sort of thing isn't for you. But let me describe the house that we lived in. The most important thing to know about the house is that it was in a suburban area. There were other houses around, but they weren't nearly piled on top of each other like they often are in urban areas. The house was three stories, and it had a basement as well. But it wasn't a finished, live-in type of basement. It was a really weird basement, dark but no dank. There wasn't a light switch at the top of the steps either. In order to turn the light on, you had to go all the way down the steps, and there was a bulb on the ceiling with a chain. Also, the staircase was not complete. It was one of those wooden board staircases. In the beginning, I never really had a problem with the basement. We kept some of our things stored down there. Plus, it was sort on an unofficial playroom for us kids. Our toy box for the younger kids was down there, so most of the time I wasn't really even down there that much. So I didn't give it much thought. The first time I had a weird issue with the basement was something that I cannot describe. One of my younger brothers didn't want to go down there by himself to get something, so he asked me if I could. I told him I would go with him, but he refused to go down there, even if he was going with me. 
I didn't give it a whole lot of thought. I understood that kids could be scared of things. I went down to the basement, again, not really thinking about anything. I turned the light on and went over to the toy box. As I was sorting through it, though, the strangest thing happened. I heard what sounded like a little girl laughing. I turned around to see if my sister was in the basement, but she wasn't. In fact, I had thought she wasn't even home. She was supposed to have gone shopping with my mom. Curious, though, I looked around the entire basement. No one at all was in the basement, least of all any little girls. So for the first time, I was a little unnerved by the basement. But it hadn't gotten to a point where it had really bothered me much yet. A while later, I did ask my little brother why he didn't want to go in the basement, but he wouldn't tell me for some reason. He just seemed really terrified of it, and he was the only one of my siblings who was like that. The other's one didn't seem to have any problem going down there. My dad would have been the type to force the kid to face his fears. But I wasn't like that. I didn't want to torment him. So for a while, if he wanted something down there, I would go and get it for him. My parents were strict about toys going back into the toy box when we were done with them, so one day I had to put away my brother's toy. I even remember what the toy was. It was Mad Scientist's Dissect an Alien, but I had no problem putting it away. I always figured I was scared as a kid sometimes, so it made sense my little bro could be too. So I went down to the basement. It was dark and a little cold, actually, but I didn't think too much about that. I walked down the steps, and I reached for the chain to turn on the light. Then I went over to the toy box and put the toy away. While I was at the toy box, I heard the noise again. A little girl was laughing. This time, yeah, it bothered me. I heard it clearly, and I knew no one was in the basement with me. So, for the first time, I was actually a little scared. I decided to just get out of the building as quickly as possible. I went over to the stairs and I turned the light off. I was a little hesitant to do that and almost just wanted to run up the steps. But I didn't. I took my time walking up the stairs. Now, keep in mind it was dark in the basement. The steps were just boards so I could see behind them and there wasn't a lot of light. But I could still see. And what I saw was terrifying. I saw the shadow of a little girl looking at me from behind the steps, and she quickly ran away to where I couldn't see her anymore. Scared, I ran up the stairs as quickly as I can. I then slammed the door and ran into the kitchen. My little brother was there, and I think he realized how scared I was. You saw the little girl, didn't you? He asked me. That was nearly as scary as seeing the little girl. I was really freaked out, and I finally understood why he didn't want to go down there anymore. For the rest of the time my family lived in the house, my little brother would not go down into the basement anymore. Regardless of what I had seen, though, I still had to go down there every now and then. I was the big brother, so it was sort of my job to not be scared. But I was. Every single time I went down there, my family moved a lot, so I really wasn't there very long. And I was glad when we moved away.